think my volume's okay. Hello and welcome to Plugin Along, a stream dedicated to Lotro plugins. Last time on Plugin Along, we started by reviewing our list of desired changes for the uh, Hidbolt Assistant plugin for the dress up quest. This let us organize them, uh, the, you know, our desired to do's uh, by a combination of how much we wanted them and how hard they are to implement. Because uh, sometimes you really want something, and it, but it's just too difficult uh, in a short term. Uh, then we started integrating in a timer control that we lifted from the Festival Buddy 2 plugin, so we can see how long we have until a piece of the dress up quest falls off. Um, today we're going to start by um, doing some Farmer Fair quest and looking at the Festival Buddy and how that works. Uh, and then we'll move on to the Hidbolt stuff. Uh, by starting and creating some debug capabilities, we want to be able to simulate picking up a piece of gear without having to find the corresponding crate. And then we'll uh, work on assigning, assigning those timers to each piece. Um, cool. Uh, as always, feel free to jump in thought with your thought, uh, jump into chat with your thoughts and questions. Uh, Aaron Bart, I know you're con uh, concerned about hitbolt spoilers. We're going to spend a few minutes here on the farmers fair. So if you haven't left already, you are spoiler free for a few minutes. Okay, uh, in chat, we already had some people talking about... Um, bu -bu -bu -bum. Oh, Pamela says, hello, hello. Sko says, hello, hello. Aaron Bard, quick question before I have to dash. Can a plugin put the server name up in the user interface as Little Redhead has it? Uh, and so Telerian said, uh, theoretically, yes, the server name is printed to chat on each slash LSC command. Uh, I'm, I pointed out that Little Redhead doesn't do it that way. Little Redhead does that as an overlay in her streaming software, but you, a, a plugin could show you the name of the server that you are on. Um, and Tilly was, was pointing out that a plugin needs to be a plugin can't know uh, using the API what server it's on. It has to use something like the slash loc command. Uh, to get that information. Uh, and I wanted to point out that the Reminders plugin does a really uh, nice job of this. So if we go to, let's see, let's go ahead and share my desktop. If we go to the Lotro plugin compendium, and we're just gonna add in Reminders. Uh, reminders has a way to manually set what server you're on, but it'll also say, hey, click here to automatically detect the server. So let's take a look at what that looks like. In fact, let me go ahead and make a new tab and uh, just so we can track any output that happens. We're gonna rename this to plugins. And we're only going to have standard, which is where plugins can write to, and error, which is what happens if your plugin has an error. Um, and we're gonna get hit that green arrow to refresh our list and load up reminders. And the first thing we see is, well, two windows, the main reminders window and a welcome to reminders. This is the first time you have logged into this server. Uh, which server are you currently logged in on? Uh, because Reminders has looked for a chunk in the server storage of plugin data uh, to, that uh, will let it know what server it's on. And when we tell it what server we're on, either by manually selecting it from this list or just pressing the detect button, which uh, is an alias to slash LOC. Um, so it, it looks like a button, but you're really hitting an alias. Uh, so that's, that's a nice uh, uh, way of doing it. Um, when it detects that, it's going to take that information, it'll be writing that out to the server storage for uh, plugin data, and then any future time that you load this plugin on, uh, well logged into this server, w the plugin will know what the server is. So I really like this approach. If any plugin needs to know what server it's on, or wants to, it doesn't need to, uh, if any plugin uh, wants to know the name of the server, uh, this is a really nice way to do it. Um, allow allow them to choose from a list of known good servers, but just in case that changes, like uh, Treebeard's on here, awesome. Shadowfax is still on here, uh, and I think Thorlore is not currently updating plugins, so that's just going to stay on there. Um, but you can also just hit detect, and it's going to say, "Cool, uh, well, I see you're on Treebeard," and it knows that because, as Talerian mentioned. Anytime you do a slash loc command, the name of the server is included in that command. I am on Treebeard server. Uh, and then there are technical details. Um, server is uh, hides the fact that under the covers, there's probably multiple machines that are acting as the Treebeard server. Or in this day and age, multiple instances across multiple machines, depending on cores and all sorts of fun things. And so Treebeard Server 17 will help anyone who's looking to use this as diagnostics kind of pinpoint, um, you know, what's <laughs> more specifically than 
Treebeard um, for things on their end. We don't have to know uh, about the 17, but it's in there because this is what you would give to um, customer support when you file a bug ticket. Uh, it'll also tell you uh, specifics about your location. And this can be decoded into coordinates, the 36.8, the 73.8. Uh, there's some boilerplate code that's out there uh, that I would like to wrap up into a library one of these days. Um, but in the meantime, just so it gets passed around from one plug into another. Uh, and so you can convert all of this into those coordinates. One of the things that's in here is actually your heading. Which direction are you pointed? You, we can see here, out of uh, 360 degrees, we're pointing at about 20 degrees off of true north. If I rotate just a little bit, uh, and we go ahead and hit slash LSC again, uh, we can see our heading is, oh, 358. Just overcorrected a little bit. And this is a fun thing, if you did not know, if your heading is exactly 0 slash 360, it is not included in the detection, uh, in the slash LOC command, which is very frustrating because now you have to account for that not being there when you're trying to parse the slash LOC command. Okay, so, reminders. Um, uses the fact that it stores the server information in a file, and if it doesn't find that, therefore it needs to know what server you're in, pops up a window and gives you a way to manually uh, choose the server, or just go ahead and click what looks like a button, but was which is actually a shortcut with the alias of slash LSC. Uh, it will then parse the slash LSC, populate this, uh, and not, not automatically close the window, uh, which could be a little disconcerting, but you detect it fills in Treebeard and then you say, okay, cool. Now it can write that information out. And any, any future time we load the plugin, it can know that that is um, the server that it's on. And you only have to do that once on each server. It doesn't matter which character you log into because it's server-wide storage that it's using. Every character that logs onto that server from now on is um, going to see that it's on the Treebeard server. Now, you don't have to um, use your own storage there. Oh, I, I should say, you could take advantage of the fact that you can read arbitrary files here. You could go and look at the plugin data, um, server, and all characters. You could look at that uh, thoroughlore server ID dot plugin data. Let me go ahead and load that up here. Well, that's funny. It says server one. Why does it say that? Oh, huh, interesting. So they do an account wide um, uh, file. So Thurlor has an account wide file that has the list of servers, and then on each server, it has an index into that. That's certainly a choice. I'm not sure why that is better, um, but sure. But any plugin can read these things. Any plugin can see, hey, if there is a Thurlor underscore server IDs dot plugin and Thurlor underscore server ID plugin for the current server, uh, I can just grab that information. I don't even have to write my own. So, so that would be a fun library to write is just check for, check for this, because if they're using reminders or any of Thurlor's other plugins that use this capability, awesome. Uh, a little plugin just says check for that. If it exists, use it. Otherwise, do this other thing. So Larian says, I think it needs to be done that way to see reminders on a dis different server. Um, good point, good point. Um, if you want the list of, yes, okay. Um, so what, what uh, th uh, Tolerian is saying is that reminders, oh, here it is. Uh, reminders will show you the, the server uh, that um, that the reminder is for. And so you do need to see the names of servers across all uh, servers, so that needs to be an account. Good point, Clearian. Thank you for, uh, for digging into that while I was not thinking about it. Awesome, so oh, I, I don't like that minimize animation. I'm, I, I think it's neat that they did it, but it's too much for me. Uh, but that is something you can turn off. Oh, they, holy, <laughs> oh, I do not like that. Um, appearance.
I know it's in here. I'm missing it. Ah well, I know I've turned it off on my, on my uh, system because uh, that that just does not look right to me. Anyway, uh, awesome. So yeah, uh, I think it would be neat to just look to see is that fire already there, and if not, go ahead and maybe just create it in that same system. Like it, you know, it's kind of funny that Thurlor stuck his name on it instead of making it a little bit more generic. But sure, like yeah, why not just uh, keep on writing two files of that name in that same structure? Uh, and then everyone can see it and Thurlor gets the credit and why not? Cool. Okay. So what I wanted to do was start by doing a fast run through. Like if you're looking to do a quick 10 quests, maybe a little bit more, uh, in the farmer's fair, what does that look like for me? And how can I use the festival buddy plugin to help me out? Um, I foolishly left my fateful toolkit on another character. Oh, well. So I begin in the, our, our neighborhood here. It's sort of a kinship neighborhood. We have ingredient crates. We have a crafting area. So my characters usually begin here. But there is swift travel to the party tree. Uh, and so even on characters that don't have um, f fast travel skills or travel skill cooldowns, I can still get here very easily. Always remember to talk to Campanilla Chubb. In fact, I want to start a timer. Just to have a sense of how long this takes me. Okay, so um, I want to talk to Campanula Chubb. And we have the wrapper. Awesome. I don't need it up though. And then it's just a question of picking up quests. So, cooling off. Yes. Don't forget the jug. Uh, defeat the heat. Yes. And ice delivery. As soon as we get the defeat the heat, we can start uh, tossing out attacks at the fires that we see around uh, town. There's, uh, depending on how many people are here, there can be a bit of a backlog, and then once you've defeated them all, you just have to start waiting for them to respawn, which is a good time to go pick up the other quests here. Now, if you, this is your first day here, there's going to be some extra quests that are like, go talk to, you know, uh, go do the races, go to the Taste of Hobbiton, all these uh, uh, vectors that take you to other places. I thought I blocked you. Okay. Um, but after you've picked them up the first time, even if you don't complete them, uh, you won't see the rings and that is excellent. So we're not doing the ice delivery here, we're going to remove that, uh, but all the rest of these are fine and we're going to uh, be working to clear everything off of this map. I'm going to start by circling this tree here, uh, cool off some patrons, grab some items that are uh, on the ground. And since I usually forget about it, oh hey, hello heat. Uh, I'm gonna duck over to this rock while I'm here. Embert says, did you just block chat of an NPC? Every time you open up a quest window, there's an option to filter the quest so that you no longer see it uh, in your, uh, uh, on the radar. Um, and I can show you that here in just a minute. Let's see. Down here at the bottom, you can see these little icons filter this quest on this character uh, or filter this quest on all characters. And that's the mechanism that we're using. If you do that, uh, then you'll go on into your filters and quests and you'll be able to see that here. I've just filtered it on, yeah, actually, let's just filter on everything for right now. Um, and so it's sometimes less, um, 100% than I would like it to be. Sometimes those rings will still show up, uh, but it, it's uh, at least good for right now. I'm not seeing that ring and being like constantly like, oh, I need to go do something about that. I need to go do something about that. No, I do not need to go do something about that. So yeah, um, last time I really tried to use that was years ago though. So I, I can't speak to how good it currently is at stopping the ring from showing up, but hey, it's not showing up right now. And that's the important thing. Now, to defeat the heat, I'm actually done on, so I should stop slaughtering those so other people get a chance. So I'm just doing a loop around the hill, and then I'll go down and make the run down to Hobbiton, uh, grabbing each of the um, items here. I'm going to move that plugin uh, window over so we can see the quest tracker here. Uh, the crash kites over there. We have the cheese basket over here. The redhead points out if the NPC has other quests, those should still show up. Yes, this is a quest-specific 
filtering, not a NPC uh, filtering. And I don't know, but I suspect it's very specifically that quest. So if uh, um, if you filter like an epic, which you shouldn't do, but if you did, like epic um, book four, book six would probably still show up. Just not the ones that uh, have an actual prerequisite of the one that you filtered. I also don't know what happens if you filter something that's already in your quest log. I assume it does not uh, uh, drop it, but I, uh, I'm not in the mood to try right now. Aaron Bard gets it. Awesome. All right, grabbing the porridge from poor Lobelia. All right, I'm going to drop off a completed quest, so I'm only tracking the ones I need to do. Uh, and we can see we're doing really good. Uh, by now, since we've uh, cleared Defeat the Heat, we're not seeing a, an area, a blob for that. And everything north and west of the hill is done as soon as I'm done uh, flying this kite. We're going to go down to the little pond next. Now, this is a two-parter. We're doing stuff at the hill and we're doing stuff in Bywater. And you can, of course, do it either way. Um, there's a quest to take the ice block down to Bywater from the hill. There's a quest to take the, uh, the frozen treats from Bywater up to the hill. You'll get a vector either way. Um, I like to sort of the... Uh, the hill just because there's swift travel there from the neighborhood instant travel really uh, whereas uh, by water the closest thing I've got is a uh, mouse one and a hobbiton on some characters and this character does not have that they have a great river milestone because that's when I'm questing with them that's where I'm questing with them which <laughs> is uh, convenient but not so good for uh Somehow I didn't click on the fresh mushrooms, but the blob on the map told me so. Um, yeah, the, that milestone is convenient except during festivals. Uh, very little happens in the Great River for uh, festivals. All right, we're already five minutes in, um, so I'm I'm not very speedy at this. I think I could optimize where I could find everything just a little bit better, but I haven't gotten there yet this time around. Now, if one was trying to do just 10 quests, I think there's some, you know, this flying the summer kite, the actual flying process takes a little while. Uh, you know, the cooling off the patrons, the actual cooling off induction takes a while. So if you were just trying to do the fastest 10 quests, you might skip the flying the, the kite, the cooling off the patrons in favor of some of the others, like the collectibles where you just run up and you grab it. Crash kites done. Fox little Tully done. And we're doing great on our map. We can see uh, we haven't left anything behind. This will be the last kite. Bread, I believe, is on the bridge. And then we have these patrons here and one over by the ivy bush. Fantastic and very sanitary. Thank you. Mm. Okay. We can see that's done. All right. We are ready to return. This is the last one. Now, if you're a hunter, uh, or if you have lots of uh, good travel cooldown skills, you could actually just uh, return to the uh, campsite fire up there as a hunter. You could return to personal housing and then take the uh, the stable master if you've got a house close to the, the farm ranging stable master. It's not actually that long of a run back up here, but you, you could shave some seconds off of it. Mostly with a hunter, with the, uh, the campsite fire, uh, you end up here up on the hill there, and it's great. Is there a milestone in Doolin, asks Aaron Bard. Yes, there is. And when I've got a character that has at least two milestones, that's what I'll generally have, is one in uh, um, Hoppet and Bywater and one in Doolin. That's a pretty, com pretty good combination for most festivals. Obviously, Midsummer, having one in Midsummer means Tirith. It makes more sense. 
Okay, so we can see this quest train did show back up on the map here. Uh, so the filtering was a little um, uh, impermanent, but I got it to go away again. All right, so that's six of the 10. Uh, like I said, uh, this does a little bit more than the 10 that you need, um, but I like the tokens and I like the, the route that just kind of clears all of those. So at this point, you just grab the ice block and you run on cross country. Uh, you want to hit the bridge. I assume that if we fall in the water, the ice will immediately vaporize. Um, so we don't want to fall in the water. So we do want to take the bridge. But running cross country avoids some of the people whose heads are on fire. The redhead says the milestone in Dulan is near the stable master. It is uh, very close to it. And if you didn't know, the location and direction <laughs> you are facing while you take the milestone to go, I think I'm stealing the redhead's thunder here. Um, the, the position you are in and the direction you are facing when you bind to the milestone, hey, there we go, um, is how you will appear when you travel. Oh, I forgot to go cross country. Uh, and so a lot of times I will try to assess what direction do I want to be running in. Uh, and you know, for Doolin, a lot of times I want to be right next to the stable master, facing the stable master, so when I zone in, I can just right click and talk without any emotion, that kind of thing. So um, in case you were feeling like you just kind of arrive in arbitrary locations, you do. Uh, it just matches how you bound in the first place. So um, if you're one of those people who just kind of runs up to a milestone and stares right at it and binds, you're just going to find yourself zoning in after you use your milestone skill, staring at the pole instead of maybe some uh, direction that's more useful. Okay. So um, we can drop off the ice delivery. We are now at the second location. Frozen sweet cream is going to be the vector that takes us back. So while I do want to pick up the, the sweet cream and the berries while we are here, um, I, we're going to pause there because another quest is going to send us into the green dragon. And so we don't want to preemptively go in there for the cream. We'll just hold off. So awesome. We got our fresh fruit done. So. We need the Festival Buddy plugin. Let's go ahead and get that downloaded. Uh, we're going to go ahead and use the Electro Plugin Compendium. Festival Buddy 2. We're going to go ahead and add that. Awesome. And we'll come into System, Plugin Manager, Refresh, and load in the Festival Buddy 2. Now, there's a little icon that will cause the window to show up and appear, uh, uh, show up and hide. It's a little fireworks icon. I'm just going to drop it here to the bottom. And we want to go ahead and come on down to the Farmer's Fair. Awesome. So this is going to be useful in a couple of ways. For a quest like the Mayor, there's a feature called Backgrounding, uh, where even if you have a different quest selected here, like Bounder Rounds, um, we'll, the plugin will keep uh, an eye out or an ear out for what the mayor says and will still pop something up on the screen uh, when appropriate. Um, uh, the traditional behavior of the festival buddy is that it does not do that. It only pays attention to the quest that you're working on. So we can see the mayor is eating right now and might need something. And the plugin will pop up, use wine. Okay, can do. And we come over and we uh, douse the mayor. Fantastic. So while that's happening, in between that, we're going to have time for other things. So Bounder Rounds is another one that's good for backgrounding. Uh, it's going to be uh, paying attention to all the hobbits. And the plugin will pop up when a hobbit says something uh, that indicates they might have had a little bit too much to drink. While that's happening, we can come on over and accept the uh, helping the uh, uh, staff in the market. Uh, and we can start getting some apples. Now, if you have any apples left over from the previous day, you can go ahead and keep those and it'll uh, progress you. So we can see I only just need the one red apple and we're done. Awesome. And we can start in on the next one. The recipe one's probably the, oh, here we go. Um, old Bad Megan's. I gotta find someone who's got a thing over the head. And remember that you can activate these uh, hobbits up to three times if you time it right before they uh, despawn and are, are chased off. So you only really need to chase away three hobbits if you want to do that. Uh, in the meantime, oh, taste of lunchroom. Where do we see text? There we go. 
So when a bad one uh, pops up, it's one of those, okay, you gotta figure out who's talking right now. And if there's multiples talking, uh, you, yeah, you just, then, here we go. Taste a mushroom, taste a mushroom, there we go. Uh, but it's much easier than looking at all the dialogue all the time. So I do appreciate the Festival Buddy plugin doing that. Um, okay, that's enough of those. And we can use milk for the mayor. Okay, let's go grab this uh, recipe. And we can see over in the Festival Buddy uh, the old style of... Uh, uh, showing guides. Uh, this predates the Midsummer Guide. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just walk down this list. It's not going to automatically check anything off. And we can see Beef Southeast Stall. There's a background for the salt, which you would think should be on the table by the mayor, but this is different salt. All right, over here for the water. Mayor wants salt as well. Exactly, that's what I'm saying, the salt's right here. Now these items actually do despawn um, after the uh, time expires, so that table is mostly empty. Grabbing the carrots. Bacon. This one's interesting because the items do not appear until you get within a few meters of their location. So this is this is one where it's very helpful to just kind of memorize where the things are. Oh, I should be going up to mushrooms. Uh, the general area of them, uh, because you're not going to be able to use your uh, uh, target next item uh, key until you get really close. All right, it's been a long trek back, or long enough to justify a mount, anyway. All right, I still need three items for the mayor, so I do want to keep an eye on that. In the meantime, we can drop off the stew. We're going to spend so much time uh, satisfying these orders, though. All right. Uh, that we'll have plenty of time for the mayor. Now, it's been a little while, and I guess a timer that shows when the next time the mayor is going to activate would be a welcome addition here. Uh, but, you know, just keeping my head like, oh, okay, now the mayor's going. So I was about to duck into the green dragon. I'd rather stay out here and let the mayor go ahead and do his thing. Toss the, the butter at him, and then go in uh, and grab the worker. Aaron Bart says, what is the target next? Uh, key combo, please. Uh, it may be one, oh, and here we have that uh, frozen treats. Um, the target next may be one that you need to assign yourself. Uh, if you go into your options, uh, Agartha confirms it's not set by default, but if you go into your key mapping um, and search for target, no, um, item, sorry. Uh, if you search for item, you can see select nearest item, which is, um, for me, it's delete. Uh, that may even be the default. Um, and then, so you just have to decide how you want to set it up for next and previous. For me, I use uh, shift and control for those. And then I try to be con uh, consistent about, um, uh, using that for other uh, key combinations as well. So your target, uh, target next for, that's funny. I just said G tab. Hmm. Backspace? No wonder I have problems. I wonder when that happened. Uh, all right, so we're gonna go ahead and say target nearest foe is tab. Yep. Uh, target next foe, what did I say? Uh, next, I'm using shift, okay. So select next foe is shift tab, yep. And previous toe is control tab, awesome. And we can see tab uh, backspace base is still listed here. I don't think that's necessary, so I'm going to actually clear that out. 
So I try to be consistent between foe and NPC and item uh, so that all of these, uh, for me, it's the key, it's shift key for next and control key for previous. Okay, uh, the last three of these rings are collecting various uh, components, uh, various vegetables. No, thank you. Uh, and so in this case, the, uh, the plugin is trying, trying to direct you to the right one. Uh, so when we get to the meat, we just can take the one on the left and that'll be fine. Awesome. Uh, next thing. Uh, Red. I ran right past it. So we're doing a right, right, left here for bread, onion, and cheese. If you get the wrong one, you fail the quest, but there's not a five minute cooldown. You can just take it right away, which is good because we only have eight minutes left here. All right, no cabbage, no meat, just green apple and into the second half. My neighbors go away for a two week uh, vacation or holiday in August. And you almost, almost forget uh, that they have two small children. Three. Sorry, three small children, thank you. Uh, and then they come back and you're like, oh right, that's, that's the sound of our neighbors. There's a small child crying next door. It's probably too faint uh, for the microphone to hear, but I hear it. Okay, so we uh, fulfilled that green grocer order. And one more. All right, cabbage on left. And then we're gonna go grab no apple, so we'll go straight over to the meat table. And you can, of course, do this in whatever order you, you want. I just always run around in a clock, uh, clockwise fashion here. Uh, so that's what I do. Uh, bread, brown bread left. So we're doing left, left, right. <laughs> it's audible but not distracting, says Aaron Brown. Oh, that's good, thank you. If we were recording a video for more like posterity oriented, like an instructional video uh, that was scripted, we'd, we'd be closing that door. <laughs> but it's such a nice uh, day out. Uh, I think it's, it's fine. Okay, uh, so we do need the mayor to go ahead and eat. Um, if he was eating, we missed it. So uh, mixing the dessert takes a while. It's a great thing to do while you're waiting for the mayor to emote. Uh, in the meantime, that's the last one. Staff in the market, we're done with. Um, the mayor, we ha need one more thing and we'll be done. And we have actually already completed our 10 quests. We're just um, going to go ahead and finish these last two uh, while we're at it. Mayor, oh mayor, it's time for you to eat something. There we go. Better not need nothing. You use butter. Uh, sometimes the mayor will just say, oh yeah, that was fine, or something similar, and then you don't need anything, and you just have to wait for it the next time. And there's like a minute between each of these emotes. It's uh, disconcertingly long. <laughs> if you're just like staring at a, you know, it's the whole watched mayor never eats thing. Okay, so we're taking the vector back to the hill. Um, and at that point, that's where I would just log off. So the next day, I would be ready to start at the hill, which is where we started before. This is more than the 10 quests, of course. Um, but if you're uh, running through for experience, as I'm usually doing, I'm trying to eat up the blue bar of bonus VIP experience. Uh, and so 10 quests doesn't quite do it. Uh, doing um, the full count of the quest and the wrapper will almost uh, eliminate this blue bar, I think. And so that's that's worth it for me to spend a couple extra minutes because most of my alts, uh, I don't know how to play them very well, most, most of the classes, so uh, free or easy experience like this is welcome. Okay, um, bringing the, where is it, Tansy? Oh, Tansy's over here. Bring the frozen sweet cream, done. And don't forget to talk to Campanella Chubb. She's like the most important person here. Done. Okay, okay, we can see actually a completely ate through that blue bar of experience. Awesome, good job, Tasha. That's my run. Uh, timer says it took 23 minutes. Maybe I uh, could shave a little bit off of that with a few, you know, less talking about it. Um, so it's not the fastest thing, but it's super easy to do that on sort of an autopilot where you're just running around and collecting all the things by the hill 
you go down to Bywater, you do the the, uh, the tasks there, and the uh, festival buddy helping you out, keeping an eye ear out for those uh, uh, things that the hobbits or the mayor will say, uh, and helping sort out those delivery. And for me, it's it's very much an autopilot thing. I can be watching uh, videos or uh, having conversations with people, and I can still keep on track. And so. Uh, if the, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are faster uh, systems out there. Uh, if they take more mental effort, maybe that's uh, maybe that's worth it. Uh, but if they don't chew through all that blue bar, then well, this character really needs to use that blue bar to uh, to level up because she's not going out and adventuring very often. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and log off Atasha and switch over to a character who is able to do hit bolt. Now's a good time to leave if you don't want hit bolt spoilers. Although we are just talking about the one quest uh, in. Uh, Harwick, so we won't be uh, we won't be spoiling anything other than that one quest. Okay, let's switch on over to Baramir here. <laughs> Aaron Bart says, "Take care." All right, have a good one. All right, before we even get really into the hit bolt side of things, we have some cha code changes from last time that we haven't committed yet. Uh, and then the first thing we're going to start off with is adding a debug capability. And this is really important uh, for plugins that require changes in game state because you don't want to have to run out into the world to click on things. AP in chat says, hi, hello. You don't want to have to run out into the world and click on things. Let's go ahead and unload everything. Uh, in order to test a plugin, you really want to be able to sit in wherever you want to sit. Uh, and test things that way. And so, as an example, the Festival Buddy 2 plugin, um, let's see, does not show debug options by default, but if we were to come on in to uh, plugins, keep plugins, Festival Buddy 2, and look and say, for instance, the maybe the globals file? Let's take a look. Debug. Well, it's not there, but let's go ahead and go into the options window. Options win. Great. Uh, debug. Sure. Uh, show debug options equals false. So we just set that to true, unload our plugins, and reload the Festival Buddy. We can see underneath all this other stuff that was already there, there's a bunch of debug options. These are things that help us test the, the plugin without having to be anywhere. So as an example, um, sometimes you want to work on a Hobnanigans uh, plugin, but Hobnanigans isn't active. What's a coder to do? Well, you fake it. While Hobnanigans is active, you gather the strings that indicate, hey, um, you've just picked up the quest for field two or field three, or the game has just started on field two. So we just picked up the quest, field two. All right, we're uh, flying feathers, we're waiting for the game to start. Hey, the game just started. Um, so it's it takes uh, one step past the game doing a thing and starts the logic from there so that you can test um, almost all of it. So assuming your chat parsing is working for uh, those other bits, you can be confident that, okay, we're seeing the plugin as it would actually happen. Uh, so if we want to go ahead and uh, score, uh, Flying Feathers have scored, Steel Beaks have scored, yay, Flying Feathers have scored again. So we can see that the plugin is responding as if we had seen the referee say that, even though we're, you know, we don't have to have nine against right now. Um, we can also do things like, say, uh, advance the time. So. Uh, this isn't something that would normally happen in the game, but sometimes you want to see, okay, I want to make sure that the transition between uh, one color and the next, one stage of the game and the next, looks uh, like it's still working. Okay, let's t test the other one. Cool, let's see what happens at the end of a game. So we'll advance to 10 seconds. So these are bonus things, not just simulating game state, but also modifying the, um, what's going on with the plugin for our own testing purposes. Cool, uh, and we can see uh, that the Flying Feathers won two to one on fields two. Hooray! Agartha says, there's a big caveat with testing chat messages though. If you send the same chat message on the channel too frequently, you can get auto-gagged. Yes, this is this is an important thing. Um, for debug purposes, uh, I wouldn't suggest sending the chat message. I would suggest um, whatever function the chat parser calls um, with 
you know, whatever function you call with this message to be handled, that's the one that we're, uh, that, that's where we're going to insert our code. So for instance, uh, let's see, um, score. Okay, so, right, um, that's what it is. If we go to the chat logger, okay. So um, the chat logger in uh, Festival Buddy, the way it works is uh, during startup, we call initiate chat logger, and that one uh, uses the turbine.chat.received uh, callback and assigns an anonymous function here that says, given a string being being received, go ahead and dispatch it based off the type of chat it is. Uh, if it's a standard, we, we want to look at it in one way. If it's say, if it's quest, we're going to look at it in other ways. This isn't the only way you, you, uh, you know, need to filter things, but the important thing is by doing the bare minimum of work in this handler and just saying, oh, we got a say, go ahead and push it off to the filter save function. Now, in the filter save function, this is being called uh, from that chat handler, but it can also be called by anywhere else in your plugin. So the options window can call filter say with this specific text. And as far as the plugin is concerned, we saw that in chat, uh, in the, the say channel. And so uh, I would recommend, it, uh, yeah, as a plugin developer, don't be sending messages out unless you have specific reason to do it and test it. Uh, instead, um, put, you know, call, uh, when you are dealing with uh, these chat messages, um, go ahead and push off the actual work out of this anonymous function that you assigned or received as soon as possible. Don't do any real work here. Any real work here that you do here is going to be harder to uh, harder to trigger during testing. In fact, it would be not at all weird for me if I if I was writing this from scratch to actually just say, um, you know, handle chat received. Right, uh, and immediately send sender and arg, and that's it. That's the entirety of this anonymous um, uh, function. Um, because even the, the 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 deal of dispatching, uh, you know, d based off of different types here, that could be something that we'd want to be able to t test a little bit uh, easier. So just you know, yeah, you have a chat log not received. Go ahead and pass it off to an actual function. That function is callable by us, and we can uh, set up sender and args however we want to do that. Um, but that being said, this small amount of work is fine. It's easy to test that it's working. Uh, so I don't have a problem with this. So yeah, whatever you do, get out of uh, this territory as soon as possible and get into the actual uh, function that is callable. That's that's my takeaway. So uh, we're gonna wanna do the same thing as Festival Buddy 2. Uh, we're gonna wanna have a options window that uh, has debug capability baked into it. So, I might just keep this uh, file here. Okay, uh, in game here, uh, in order to pick up the dress up quest in Harwick for rebuilding Hidbolt, we are going to need to go ahead and grab Aiding the Eastern Net from Ringwald, Rinwald here in Hidbolt. I've already rebuilt Hidbolt enough that there is a. Actually, on this character, I may have rebuilt the whole thing, but at least the uh, Milestone and the Stable Master. I may not have bothered to spend the tokens to rebuild. I guess since Edgall has quest for me, yeah, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I did it on uh, a couple other characters. All right, so we have the wrapper aiding the Eastern Net. With that, we can go to any of the rebuilding Hidbolt NPCs. And pick up quests from there. By default, if you complete five of those quests while Aiding the Eastern Nut is active in your quest log, you can, uh, Aiding the Eastern Nut uh, finishes and you can't pick up any more of those quests. However, you can just pick up all of the quests first, drop Aiding the Eastern Nut, and then complete those quests at your leisure. You will miss out on a little bit of legendary item experience and seed experience and some enhancement runes, uh, but nothing worth uh, not making progress on collecting those tokens of Hidbolt if that's what you're looking for. The tokens of Hidbolt can be used to not only rebuild Hidbolt, but also get yourself kindred reputation with each of the four factions of Eastern Rohan, uh, Men of the Wold, uh, Men of Sutcrofts, Norcrofts, and, and Washvale. 
Uh, so it's uh, those tokens are super useful to collect as quickly as you can. You can also use them to get the silver tokens of the world. Uh, so they're just all around great. All right, we're gonna go ahead and talk to Garbrandt and get ourselves dress up. Fantastic. Okay. So the thing that we want to emulate is the picking up of items. And the problem that we have here is that the way we know that we picked up an item is that it's an effect applied on our character. So what we're gonna be doing here for the next umpteen minutes is um, separating out the detection of effect from the, the updating of the UI. Oh, Headbolt's not active, let's go ahead and load that, and we'll have Festival to load it too. All right, so, hit bolt, really? And press unload, did I? Slash hit, I spelled hit bolt wrong. So, um, in the quest guide for dress up, we uh, can see that we have said we want gloves for the winter. So when we pick this up, when we see that effect added, um, stuff happens. So we need to um, break apart the detection of an effect being added or removed from the code that does stuff because generating a fake effect is uh, may not be worth it. It's really a question of what's the code doing with that effect. Uh, and then in the um, in the options window, we want to go ahead and have a uh, just a little grid where for each of the three types we can activate each of the six uh, outfit uh, pieces. And it'll look something like a grid like this. When just grid of buttons, you can press the buttons, it does the thing. Uh, it does not have to be fancy, it's only for us. Okay, so that's the plan. Um, and we've got at least an hour to do it. So, uh, th something we added last time was we hoisted out the timer control from uh, Festival Buddy 2 and inserted it in, uh, in here to Hidbolt. And we haven't actually committed that yet. The timer control itself depends on turbine class files. And so if, these were, if this was packaged up as a library, you would need to have instructions that say, hey, this import statement, you need to update it to match your current layout. Uh, and that could be the plugin author, the name of the plugin, and hopefully you have some structure in there that lets you uh, put these in a turbine files folder instead of just scattered around with your main um, plugin files. It really depends on how many plugin files you have. If you only have a couple of files, a few more doesn't matter. When you start having 20 or 30 files, um, organizing them a little nicer uh, can make a big difference. So we've added a timer control and class and type, and We'll go ahead and include the to-do file updates in this, and we import that timer control. Awesome. This is just test code, just making it appear. We don't want that yet, so we're not gonna commit that. So, uh, added a timer control class from Festival Buddy 2. Great. Now the timer control is one of those things that um, works by sorry, I'm just um, thinking. Um, anyway, sorry, the timer control is one of those things that just works by uh, saying I want you to, to call my update function as often as you can. Every time there's a UI update, call me as well. Which means the function is getting called you know, 30 or 100 times per second depending on your frame rate. Uh, and so it's one of those things where you can, and maybe even should, go ahead and have a check in there that says, if it hasn't really been very long since the last time I did this, a tenth of a second, a twentieth of a second, uh, just go ahead and do nothing. So that you're not repainting yourself every time you're in there, you're just doing it a reasonable number of times per second. Uh, I don't think we bothered to do that in this timer class, but it, you know, it would be an idea. So in this update, update, So yes, in this handle update function, uh, we, we don't do anything if the timer is stopped, but if the timer is started, we do all of this every time the function is called. And it would, it's pretty straightforward to go ahead and, and have a thing that says the last time we did something and get the current time. And if the difference between them is not big enough, don't do anything. 
and so you're doing one subtraction and one conditional, uh, and those tend to be pretty fast things. Uh, now the downside is you're doing a subtraction between two uh, decimal uh, floating point numbers instead of two integers, I think, because it's uh, fractional, but it's still, um, you know, probably faster than doing the rest of this. But one of the problems when you tra start talking about efficiency is that uh, what we think is faster and what is actually faster can often be very different. And so it's one of those things where it might even be worth you know, doing some measurements and being like, how, how, many, uh, how much time does it take for this to run? Or how, you know, at least do more analysis than just like, that's a lot of lines of text. Anyway. Uh, it's a thought that occurs to me when we import this timer control, but we're not going to deal with it right now. We'll wait until there's an actual performance issue. Probably. Okay, so what do we have? We have a pretty clean working directory. We just have this sample timer code. So let's talk about an options window. The What we saw um, in the Festival Buddy was that there was a thing called options win. Now, that's a bit of a misnomer because a lot of plugins don't actually have a separate window for their options, but they could. Um, you can have a control that exists in the options window and probably also in a separate window. I actually don't know how this game deals with an element that exists in two separate places. I would hope it would be fine and they would just stay in sync, um, but... Um, we're just going to uh, probably just call it options because our intent is that this is going to be embedded within uh, the plugin manager. I, I don't intend to have a separate window. So let's go ahead and create a new file. I will just call it options.lua. And we'll get started. And in fact, I might go ahead and open that up over here. Options win. Uh, and we can use that as inspiration. We also need another thing, which is where's that initialize? Probably be main options. Draw options win. All right. Great. Okay, that'll work. Okay, so same thing. We want to uh, do that over here. We are going to go ahead and import import Galahad plugins dot hitbold dot options. Okay, uh, so we know it's going to get imported. And oh, we also need to make sure we do something about that. Uh, do we have something similar? All right, load data, check character data, draw windows. Awesome. Let's go ahead and put in a draw uh, options. Yeah, I'm gonna call it control because again, I don't think I'm uh, dealing with a whole window here. Uh, and in here, draw options control function. Even better if you spell function correctly. And then IntelliSense is happy with that. So we should be done with our main windows. And now it's just whatever we're doing in options. OK. So big one, we want that show debug options equals true over here. The next thing we need to do is tell the game, here is the thing we want you to draw in the options area. And the very first uh, lines here is how that works, is we're declaring our options as a UI control, and we're saying plugin dot get options panel equals this. Plugin is a special variable that's available during a plugin uh, setup and, and teardown, uh, and the get options panel is just a function that gets called, and you return a UI element that gets drawn. Whoops. Okay, we can do this pretty uh, a basic test options. Um, set uh, set back color, and we're just going to do turbine.ui.color.blue. 
Hello, little cat. What's up? You feeling better? I don't know, you threw up earlier. Okay. Well, she moved quickly, which is good. Otherwise, I was going to pick her up and stick her in front of the camera. Okay, so what we've done is we've said, here's a control. Please show it whenever someone goes to the options. And by the way, its background is blue. Let's take a look at that. If we unload, reload Hitbolt Assistant, now when we go to options, it doesn't say there are no options. It says this instead. Now we can see the default size of options, uh, default height uh, are being shown by the amount of this that is blue. Awesome. Uh, we're going to keep that blue for a while just so we can keep an eye on things. Now, if the height of this were significantly large, I think we'd get a scroll bar for free. Let's, uh, let's see. We do get a scroll bar for free. Awesome. And so we don't have to worry about that. And then we can draw whatever we want in here. So, for instance, we can say if show debug options, then uh, and start uh, writing stuff. What do we want to show up in there? Uh, and the answer is function. We want to go ahead and uh, hmm, okay. Well, that's that's true. They invert that. I, I could see that. If not, show debug and then return. And I like that better. Less indentation. Uh, so what we want to do is go ahead and start drawing the various things and a different function for each chunk. Uh, going into the options is great. So draw quest guide dress up. Cool. And we can just go ahead and call that. Options. Okay. Takes care of drawing the debug options. Or dress up. Uh, and the param options, that is a control. And undefined global. I sure did forget to update that name. Great. And giving us uh, that little documentation just uh, lets us know that it's ex expecting the control. Awesome. The top level control given to get uh, options panel. Cool. FutureOS will thank us. Uh, now that will show up in the IntelliSense uh, hover over. Okay, so we are able to go ahead and do our thing. Now, what we might also want to do is accept the height of the, the place that we're trying to work in. Um, we can be as, as generic or as, as rigid as we want to be uh, where things are being placed here, but it's a good idea to have things relative to a certain uh, top point, so you can slide that top point down and everything else sh uh, slides with it. So at the very least, having a Y point that you're starting at. So local um, quest guide press up Y equals, and then we can set that. Uh, right now it's zero, which is where we would have defaulted to, but we can later change it and everything should slide on down. Okay, so we need a label. Label describing section. And then we need um, six uh, uh, what do we call these things? Well, what's the quest call it? Types of pieces in three a button for each of six types of pieces in three different outfits. 
We'll just call it that. Okay, so that's what we need in this. Uh, so first of all, let's make a label. So uh, local label equals turbine.ui.label. And we can go ahead and set the text, set text. This is debug code, so we don't have to worry about localization. It's mostly meant for the plugin author, who is me. So this is dress up debug. And we want us to go ahead and uh, set position. Actually, I don't even care about the position too much because it will default to the upper left. Let's go ahead and see what that looks like. We did not label a set parent to options. Cool, so dress up debug. We can see, uh, first of all, let's go ahead and say uh, set back color to uh, turbine.shell.rightline. Uh, that's a different thing. Actually, let's go ahead and add a function somewhere. Function uh, get random color. Uh, and what that's going to do is we're going to go ahead and say uh, return turbine.ui.color. And we want a rand. But I can't remember how to do that in Lua. That's no problem. There's plenty of references. Lua random number. Math.random. Awesome. So we want a color. We want math.random. And it'll be a returns the float in the range of 0 to 1. Sounds great. math.random, math.random. OK. Um, cool, we're going to set that back color to a get random color. Now, why am I doing this? Mostly to amuse myself. Uh, but um, by doing this, you don't have to worry about manually finding a different color and a different color and a different color, things are probably going to be different colors. And if anything does end up too close, you can just unload and reload and you'll get completely different ones. Perfect. Uh, okay, so first of all, we want to go ahead and do uh, change the size of this thing. So options, uh, set height, let's go ahead and at least set it to be like 200 pixels tall. And then we can see that the label is not wide enough. So label set width, and we'll set the chain, leave that back color to be last. And let's go with like 200. That uh, seems like a good number of pixels. OK. We can see the height is way too much. So let's go, instead of a width, we'll do size. And we'll do 200 by I don't know, 20. Let's see. Now, it doesn't actually matter if the label's too big. Um, it's transparent in the places where there's not text. Um, so I'm not going to worry about resizing this label to be shorter. It's fine. Cool. But it is, uh, if we did like to have margins, uh, that would be nice. And so let's go ahead and say this is 10 down. And we're going to go ahead and say label set position is going to be um, 10, uh, yeah, 10 over and starting from Y. Awesome. So now we need buttons. Uh, and we need to be able to call a callback from each of these buttons. And it would be neat if we didn't have to write 18 different callback handlers. So let's write just a single button and kind of follow that logic to see what needs to happen on the other end. So we'll just do a winter helmet. So um, local button equals turbine.ui.lotro.button. And button, we're going to go ahead and set text. Make this less hard coded. So helm, uh, helm winter. Okay. Uh, 
we're going to go ahead and say button uh, set back color to get random color. So we can uh, actually, we're not going to need that because the button itself is skimmed. Uh, button set to position though, set position. We're going to want that to be, let's call it 10 over and y equals y plus uh, 20. So we can still use y because that's incremented on down. Okay, we forgot to set the parent. Let's see, like the most important thing you can do for UI control. Button set parent options. Great. So we can see it's not big enough. Uh, so we do want to go ahead and say button set width to, I don't know, 50. Let's see how 50 looks. That's probably what it already was. Let's just double it up. Helm winter, great. Uh, now there's winter, regal, and balladeer. Uh, so it might be useful to go ahead and, and start with Ballardier. Uh, for sizing purposes. And maybe 125 uh, suits us better. Fantastic. Okay. So by making the right size for the largest one, now if we're uh, programmatically generating the text that goes in here, then we don't have to worry about having a prog programmatically different size, although one could do that. Uh, all right, so position is fine. Uh, now we just need a click handler. So button dot click equals anonymous function with center and args. And right now we're just going to go ahead and say turbine dot shell dot right line uh, helm fella deer clicked. So coming into options, click that, we can see Helm Balladier clicked, so the handler is working just fine. Awesome. So, real question is, what now? And actually, having the text on here doesn't make sense, now that I think about it. Uh, local label, um, so label piece equals turbine dot uh, UI dot label and this is going to say uh, label piece uh, set text that's going to be helm and we're going to do the same things uh, we're going to remember to parent this label piece set parent uh, is going to options. We're going to uh, probably need to set the size. So label piece set size, maybe just 120. Little piece set back color, get random color, but also uh, the position. Label piece set position, and this is going to be you know, m margins over and then whatever our current Y is. We actually want to do a different one though, right above this. So it's going to be labeled outfit. And for this, we want, let's just say winter. Uh, we want this position to be indented a bit, so we're going to say, I don't know, uh, 30 maybe? Uh, and then after this, we need y to be equal to y plus 20. And we need the button to move in as well. Let's assume 30 is going to be enough. It's not, but it'll give us a starting point. Okay, so we can see uh, 30 was not. Uh, so let's come on in to local... Uh, column 1x equals 50 maybe and then we only have to change it in a single place okay uh, we can see that that's probably good enough and helm baller deer uh, we don't need that we just need x and now that uh, is much too large is it 25 even enough yeah that's fine so what we want is you know a column for winter, a row for helm, and then just xxx. Well, not just winter, but um, 
our other ones as well. So let's go ahead and let's I, I want to kind of make a loop that makes this and then make a loop that makes these uh, but we're getting into the point where we kind of need to answer the question of what do we do in this click handler right here. Once we've clicked it we can know what we were. So local, um, you know, uh, what are we calling these things? Piece equals helm. We have local um, outfit equals balladeer, right? We have these, and so what we really need is piece dot dot uh, dot dot outfit dot dot. Uh, clicked. Right, so that's what we need, is we need a loop that fills in piece and outfit uh, and then stuff. So that's what we're going to be playing with now, uh, is what happens in here and how can we use that to inform uh, how to make these things. We don't have to be going through this problem, but the g genericizing of our logic here is probably going to be helping uh, um, make sure the code that we've written isn't wrong in some way. Uh, if we just went ahead and made 18 of these, uh, that would work fine, it, whatever, but uh, we want to make sure that this is not uh, something you need to, to, to hand code it. So let's take a look. What is going on when we get a piece of this equipment? So I'm gonna go ahead and close a bunch of things. All right, so we get a crate of gloves. You found the correct piece. Gloves of the winter, awesome. Now what? Uh, let's go ahead and see if we can remember where this is happening. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the map control. This is probably in the quest win. All right, so uh, in our quest room, uh, sorry, quest win, create quest area, probably don't need that. Load quest dress up, awesome. What's going on? All right, so in our effect added, we can see there's a lot of stuff in effect added. And just like what I was saying before, uh, the more of this we can move out of there into its own function, the better. And so let's go ahead and just do that right now. Uh, he's, he's almost like his face. Hey, there's a cat sitting back there. Awesome. Right the okay, good job, Casper. You're on stream now. Hey. <laughs> so let's go ahead and make a function for each of those. Function. Um, now we're going to call this thing handle effect added. Handle effect added. And what are we getting? We're getting sender and args from here. Let's go ahead and just pass those on. Uh, and then all of this can just be handle effect added sender args. And these can come on in here. And one of the things this will help us do is isolate what's in here, uh, what we're, we're referring to that we still need access to. So this reverse lookup, what is that? Okay, reverse lookup. These are things that were defined in here that should not be defined within this function. Awesome. Okay, let's take a look. Um, resources, quest. Maybe have a data uh, directory? Let's make a data directory. This is probably going to change a couple different ways. Data. Okay. Data, we're going to make a new uh, folder in here, call it quests. 
We're going to make a new folder in here, call it dress up. And it's an interesting uh, way of collapsing these things. Okay, and within here, what we need is to start pulling out pieces here. Uh, so we need um, a core file and then the language specific things. So new file, we're going to have dress up. Let's start with data. Data dress up dot Lua. And we also want uh, data dress up uh, en dot Lua. Okay, so we want to go ahead and import some of that stuff here, and we want to remember how to do that. I don't, so I'm just going to copy it from somewhere else. Awesome. So we want to make sure that we're importing these things. Now we'll hit hit bolt, and this is going to be in data. This is going to be quests dress up. Uh, and then that's going to be data dress up. And I would hope to go ahead and dress up itself will go ahead and include the correct language. Uh, import language file based off of current, uh, client language. But for now, that's just going to be English as that's what we've got. So we import that address up, that address up will import the strings. We're good to go. Um, let's go ahead and pull this on over. So what do we have? Options was, no. Um, where was it, globals? We had these values in globals. This is, uh, something we want to go ahead and remove and hopefully everything still just works. Let's test that. It does not. Awesome. Because images was using them. So one thing we're going to go ahead and do is say images, and we're going to go ahead and okay. uh, if images uh, quests equals nil, then uh, go ahead and initialize it. We've got quests equals a uh, table end. Uh, and then same thing with quest uh, dress up. That dress up equals nil. Then quest that dress up equals that. Because finally, we're going to go ahead and um, initialize all of this. So instead of images equal, there'll be images.quests.dress up equals, and in here, we can go ahead and hoist all of this. Now this should all happen after images, so if quests equals nil, then, oh yeah, if images equals nil, then we just have a problem. So if images equals nil, then uh, we're going to go ahead and system no, <laughs> turbine wrong one. Uh, shell dot right line error images not defined before data dress up dot Lua needs it. Cool. End. Um, not going to bother exiting or anything. We can just keep on going. It just won't work. 
All right. Uh, okay, so we have all of this. That means our quest dress up can be excised from images. And that was the big problem is images was trying to use Helm's Winter Regal Balladeer, all of this. Um, and that was not available. So let's give that a try. Load. More problems. So many more problems. Build import package. Well, that's fair. Let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Data, quests, dress up. And let's just make sure I spelled it correctly. Okay. Um, fail to import package, fail to import. Ah, table index is nil. Awesome. Yes, it would be, wouldn't it? Winter, Regal, and Balladeer. Fair enough. Uh, let's actually do that as like the last thing we do here. Okay, different problems. Attempt to index field. Awesome. Oh, uh, this is in the quest window. So let's come on back here and look at 376. You know, I was assuming that, but let's let's go look. Uh, quest one is here. Awesome. Um, images is up here. Yes. Let's go ahead and keep on moving stuff out. Create locations. Might be worth hoisting that at some point. All right. Let's get these English version of strings out. Hmm. All right, we're going to go ahead and hoist this. I have a feeling all this is going to be more trouble than I was anticipating. Let's go ahead and not change stuff too much. All right, so we need Winter Regal and Balladeer, but we need these to find before we can do some other stuff. So doing this last may not be the right move, but doing it after we define these probably is. Let's go ahead and start with that. We have these versions. Sure, we'll even, no. Nope. We don't need that, we're in the EN uh, file. Okay, outfit strings. Um, where is this being used? In effect removed. And handle effect. Great. I want to change these names later to be a little bit more globally um, correct. We can see uh, the fact that they don't start with the uppercase letter is upsetting the IntelliSense all by itself. Okay, outfit info. What was I doing with that? Don't know. But it looks very generic, so I'm going to move it. Okay, we're 
reverse lookup. Awesome. Okay, so first thing we really need to do is say what all do we still need? And it looks like we still need dress up area. So let's make sure dress up area gets passed in. And what else do we have? All right, we got a problem here. Why are you red? Maybe that's just changed. Okay, let's see if we can load that. We cannot. So, quest win, 376. Oh no, uh, lines have changed dramatically, 262. So, add outfit. Um, attempt to index field. Uh, this is at line 262. So this is here, image quest dress up. So what we want to do is go ahead and say turbine.shell.writeline, and we're going to go ahead and dump uh, images. Because I'm curious what's going on with that. OK. So images. Um, do we have quests? Quest, oh yes, there we go. Quest contains dress up, which contains chest, which contains stuff, leggings, great. Okay. Real question, why are those strings? Okay, um, so we have piece and outfit, so we need to check that next. Um, piece. Outfit. So we're going to start with that. And we can see we're getting piece nil, outfit nil. That uh, is a pretty good sign of what is wrong. Um, which is weird because winter should be a reference to this, which is being imported. Uh, what's going on? Dump piece. Up is no. But why? Okay, just the one. Um, okay, so set piece is coming in, create carousel. Uh, piece is coming in. All right, what's coming in with the create carousel? Helms. Okay. So let's come into the crate carousel and see what we see there. All right, we have peace. Um, yeah, that'll be fine. Great carousel, peace. All right, we can see that is nil. Now, I'm not a fan of that because it shouldn't be. We should be passing in helms. But certainly if helms is nil here, that would do it. Uh, so turbine.shell, well, you know what? We'll just go ahead and copy that. Great. So we can see Helms is not resolving there either. Oh, of course. Um, 
we moved stuff into a different namespace, and that's a problem. Uh, all of these things here um, would be better uh, integrated into the code if we go ahead and say, no, it's, it's not all the way down in this other namespace, it's somewhere else. We can see now Helm is there, all right. So let's go ahead and start with this to do don't store everything in global but that's a you know tomorrow problem kind of thing okay so anything else where we defined things uh, images worked uh, and we stuck things in images so that's fine outfit info let's go ahead and do global verse lookup awesome and then outfit strings as well and then each of these, just going to do a multi-select. OK. Now those should all appear where we were expecting them and the plugin modes. All right. I, this catches me every time. Whenever I move stuff around, I'm not used to this the location on disk affecting how you access it in code. Uh, it doesn't really do that in C++, C Sharp, any of the things I'm more used to but it absolutely does it here. So uh, when you move stuff around, you're going to have to do something. Now, we can do better than just shoving it all in the global namespace, but that does at least let the plugin load. So yay. OK, let's keep moving then. Um, we have handle effect added. We want to go ahead and handle effect removed. And that's going to be all of this code. Okay, we still need the dress up area. And then we can get rid of everything else. Let's take a look at that. We'll go ahead and grab this crate of gloves. Awesome. Things seem to be working. Uh, one thing I will say is that our options, we need two buttons, two buttons for each of these. Put on, take off. So we should have a plus button uh, and then a minus button. It looks like there's a minimum width of these buttons. Uh, yeah, so we're going to have a plus button and. Cool, we did that. Uh, minus for the remove. Awesome. OK, so what does that mean for us? It means that we now could call handle effect added and handle effect removed easily from elsewhere, from the options. However, when we look at handle effect added, we need to pay attention to how args is added, or how args is used. And we use it by using uh, calling get effect from effect callback. OK, what is it done here? OK, so what we need is oh, yeah, that's that's going to be called and then the effect name is we're going to call a, you know we're going to call get name on the thing uh, and that's a problem do we use effect for anything else we use the id okay so we need to pass in something that in args Um, hmm, that's an interesting idea. Uh, I am very tempted to hoist out the get effect from effect callback here and pass something into the function that is going to satisfy the requirements of having git name and git ID. 
Uh, and that's going to help us extract out the stuff that's really hard to simulate and the stuff that's easier to simulate. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and hoist up local effect equals get effect from our callback. And then we're not even using center and arc, so we are going to go ahead and pass effect uh, dress up area. And then we're no longer going to call that. And let's do the same thing here. We're going to call get effect. And we're going to pass that in. And again, we're not using sender anyway. And args was only being used for args.effect. Why were we calling args.effect? What were we using effect for? Assume that we didn't want that. Okay. Um, okay. Well, that's the real question. We're doing args dot effect in here. Args dot effect. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're gonna pass in effect. We're no longer gonna be accessing it from ac accessing it from in here. Uh, and now, when we pass something into here, we need whatever it has to have a get name function and a get ID function. That we can that we can work with. So same thing in here, we're gonna pass in effect. So let's take a look at that refactoring. If we pick up gloves, Interesting. Okay, uh, the color is not right. Now the color is right. Oh. Right. All right, we need to clear out some of this other debug. OK, we are seeing that's what it was. Oh, 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 yes. We did. We worked on this last time, and I had forgotten the importance of it. And because I didn't add a piece of comment to the code, that got lost. And so what we need is um, args dot effect. Um, so we need is args effect nil. So local is args effect nil equals args dot effect equals nil. Because what we had here, and I gotta scroll way down now. So for the removal, let's go ahead and pop this up in here. We wanted to make sure that args.effect was not nil. Maybe we should phrase it that way. Is args effect not nil? So we're going to pass that in. Uh, effect removed. Because that's the thing that we cared about here. Uh, that was because when I think got removed, oh sorry, when we had an effect on us and then the plugin loaded and then we picked something up from a box, we were getting um, something irregular going on. And so now if we load this, we still have that effect on, 
now it's green. Now we can ignore an incorrect identify, incorrectly identified um, effect. I feel like that's probably a bug, but it's a, a bug we can work around, so it's okay. So the is our effect not nil, um, that's important enough to be a named thing. But now, because it's just a parameter to a function, we can turn that on or off at will and test that behavior if we want to. So we are done hoisting out this stuff. In fact, uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and take a snapshot of that. Let's commit our changes. Okay, hoisted. No, moved. Uh, dress up data into your own files. So that's that, that's that, that's that, all of that. And probably so much of this. Now we don't want this. Uh, moving all of this is good. And all of this was actually refactoring those functions. So we can do that in two different commits here. Uh, the options themselves, we're not worried about that. Main, not worried about that. So this is just moving the data into its own files. And then in quest window, we can go ahead and say, extracted effect, added, removed code into functions. And that's gonna be this one here. Well, it was all of them. Great. Yep, handle effect added, handle effect removed. We're good. And that just leaves us with the changes we've started to make with the options. Fantastic. Okay, so now our adding or removing can call these handle functions. Handle effect added, handle effect removed. So we need to go ahead and do something about that. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and with the plus, we're gonna call handle effect added. And the effect is gonna be a thing. I'm not sure what that's gonna be yet. Uh, so local effect equals a table. Uh, effect dot um, get name uh, equals a function that takes a sender and So we're going to do a turbine dot um, shell dot right line, and we're going to say handle. Of, we're in handle effect added. Oh, nope, don't copy the whole line. And we're going to say um, an effect name. And ID. Okay, so effect get name equals a function that uh, return the name of the effect end, uh, and then effect um, get id equals a function return n oh, one two three four, and then we handle the effect. That's that, and oh, what do we do with those dress up areas? I can probably just grab that, right? There we go. Okay, let's give that a try. So, unload, reload. What happens if we hit that plus? All right, we get a name, name of the effect, ID, one, two, three, four. Awesome. So we don't need that uh, helm level, whatever, clicked anymore. So we can 
What does that plugin do? Oh, some days it feels like not very much. Um, let me go ahead and finish the line of code I was just changing. So um, for the name, we're going to go ahead and return close of the winter. And for the ID, that can still be 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, undo plus. You found the correct please. Awesome. So what does the plugin do? Uh, Bill Slowski asks, what does the plugin do? Head Build Assistant was a plugin by Galahad that tracked your progress through the rebuilding of Hidbolt. So it would detect when you finished one of the rebuilding deeds uh, and would uh, mark them off as you go. It would also tell you how many tokens you needed in order to complete it. Uh, it also estimate how many days worth of quests you would need to do. I assume based off of the getting uh, however many per day, 50 a day uh, with eight in the east in that. Um, what I have been doing is adding the idea of um, helpers for some of the quests that you do in order to rebuild Hidbolt, or that you can do. Here in Hidbolt, um, so rebuilding Hidbolt, uh, there are three quest givers at each of the th four capitals. So um, Harwick here in the Wold, Cliving in the Norfold, Snow uh, Snowburn in the, or, sorry, Norcross, um, Cliving in the Suckcrofts, and Aeoworth in the Antwash Vale. So there's three NPCs. One of them gives you pairs of quests that you go into a public instance and you complete them there. One of them gives you a quest to go into a public instance and defeat mounted enemies. Uh, and one of them gives you, you know, uh, more flavorful um, location-specific quests. And Garbrand gives you a hobby horse where you race around town on a hobby horse or Herman Bandage, which is like tag with the children of Harwick and dress up what we're working on now. The goal of dress up is identify the pieces that the dress up model is wearing, go around town opening up crates until you find the correct piece for each of the six uh, locations, um, boots, leggings, uh, chest, gloves, shoulders, helm, and then return and stand in front of the dress up model before any of the pieces falls off after five minutes as it does. So that's the dress up quest in a nutshell. Uh, find the pieces, return here. But one of the problems I have with this quest is that um, is first of all remembering what the dress up model has and so in this quest helper you go ahead and you adjust the uh, the image and I need to uh, update these images but they work fine enough for now you adjust the images to match what the uh, quest giver is wearing yep uh, and so we can see that uh, this quest this dress-up model wants a regal helm, winter shoulders, balladeer chest, uh, winter gloves, winter pants, and winter boots. Very, very wintry. Uh, so you go find each one of those, and what's in each uh, chest always is the same type, but uh, which of the three outfits, regal, winter, or balladeer it is, can change. And so you can't just memorize, so it seems, uh, each of those. But you can wander on over here to this crate of gloves and open it up and find out that it has gloves of the winter. Hur hooray. And so the goal of the plugin is to tell you, A, you got it, and B, go ahead and hide any of the corresponding um, chests that contain gloves, or crates that contain gloves. Uh, no longer show them on the map. So you can only navigate to the ones that you need to navigate to. So hopefully <laughs> that makes some amount of sense, uh, Bill Slowski in chat. Right now we're trying to do uh, test uh, tests though where we can act as if we found the correct piece of gloves or that piece has fallen off so um, uh, that's where we're, where we're at yeah we have managed to separate things out so that we can call handle effect added and hopefully handle effect removed that's the next test Um, and then we'll have one for each piece, or a set of these two for each piece. All right, so we want to handle effect removed. Is Argo effect not? No, true. 
it's not now. Okay, uh, those buttons are not far enough apart. Now we'll just shove it over by the width of the other button and see how that goes. All right, so we can do plus, we found the card piece, and minus, it fell off. Oh, that's so good. Okay. Now, something that, that sh tells me, and I hope this is already in the to-do file, is that if a piece falls off, the dots should come back. If a piece falls off, unhide those plates. Unless we've been coloring in the good crates. All right, just a thought for later. Okay, so we're able to simulate, we picked up the right one, oh, it fell off. Obviously, this won't work for turning the quest in, but it does work for triggering um, things hiding on the map. So for instance, uh, we are here, and that plus two other dots should color and fade away. Yes, they do that. Okay. Awesome. So in order for this to work, the add and remove need to use the same ID, effect ID. Um, so if I hit negative, actually if I get real gloves and I hit negative, it doesn't do anything because it doesn't match the ID. So if I get the fake ones and then I remove them, that works. So each one of these will need its own um, ID. Is that true? Not so much because each carousel should keep track of its own item ID. So they could all be one, two, three, four. Okay, that's good. Um, or zero for that matter. Okay, so the real question is how do we uh, set this up so that we can create plus and minus buttons for each one? Well, um, in our data files, oh, and we're getting really close to the end here. Um, of the scheduled time. Let's go ahead and say, we've made some really good progress here, uh, extending, uh, making debug functionality, and in, I, I should back up. Um, one of the things I really like about what we're doing here with the debug functionality is it's very similar to test-driven development, which is to say, uh, we're trying to use the code in and in doing that, uh, it is causing us to reevaluate how the code is written and do, do, does it need to be a little bit more modular uh, and so on. And so we're going to um, continue this into uh, the next stream where we finish up the debug and can go ahead and programmatically create these buttons. And if we can programmatically create them, I think that uh, bodes very well for all of this working uh, for us. Um, in the meantime, yeah, as we are probably not going to be able to finish this tonight, I'd say at the moment, uh, now's a good time to get any last minute questions, comments, concerns into chat so we have a chance to look at them before the end of the stream. Uh, okay, so Data Dress Up has Winter, Regal, and Balladeer. It does. What it doesn't have, what it doesn't obviously have is an integer, um, indexing for the rest of these. Because what I would like to do is I would like to be able to uh, have four loops, four 
Um, you know, the value equals 1 to 3 for value equals 1 to 6. And d something based off of that. So let's go ahead and take a look at all the things that reference helms here. Okay, we use them in the construction of these crates. Okay. Okay, you know what? I that's a problem I don't need to solve right now. Uh, um, P says equals. Um, helms equals shoulders, uh, chests, gloves, leggings, and six equals boots. Now I can uh, into uh, oh okay we do the same thing actually. Um, we have pieces and we have outfits. Okay, this is kind of a reverse lookup table for these values, but it means uh, I could potentially just do a for loop from outfits.winter to outfits.ballardier if I wanted to, um, or pieces.helm to pieces.boots. That would be a sensible thing to write now. Um, okay, so in our options window, just pulling that on, on over here, what I would like to do is a little demonstration of what I'm trying to do. So for um, oh man, how do you write for loops in this uh, language? For loop, numeric for, that's exactly what I want. I'll say var equals that, comma that, comma that, okay, cool. So for um, i equals one, uh, well, i equals outfits dot winter, um, outfits dot balladier, nope, uh, do, and for j equals uh, pieces dot helms to pieces dot boots do. And what I'd like to say is um, use that in a lookup here. Um, turbine dot shell dot right line. Uh, what we want is outfit strings, and that's the um, J and I. Okay, that didn't work. Oh, options has not been loaded first? Where does options happen? Options. Yeah, let's load options a little bit later in the order here. Oh, of course, initial value must be a number. Oh. I was too clever for my own good. That's okay. Um, fine. This isn't going to change anytime soon. Time to index field, hit bolt options 27. Hey, little one. You want to get on camera? Hey. Wow, yeah. Woof. Hello, Kato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she is not a fan of getting picked up, I'm afraid. No, you're not. No, you're not. You are a fan of stepping on my keyboard, though. Yes, you are. Okay, outfit strings. It does not like the look of that. Is that true? Let's see. Okay, uh, we're just gonna dump outfit uh, strings here. 
and see if that's true. No, it loves outfit strings. Okay. I... It's going too fast then. Um, this value here, we need to plumb, plug in. Okay. Uh, so we need J. That actually needs to be pieces of J. And it needs to be outfits. It actually doesn't because that's um, numerical on both sides. Okay. There we go. So that allows us to iterate through, and we get helm of the winter, shoulder of the winter, breastplates of the winter, gloves of the winter, leggings of the winter. So we're going through all the winter, then all the regal, and then all the ballard deer. And importantly, if we wanted to see it the other way, we could do that. We could do all the types. Helm, shoulders, breastplate, gloves, leggings, boots. And that's actually the order we probably want it in. So I and J, I and J. So swap it around like that. Okay, so we've kind of proven to ourselves that we have an easy-ish um, easy way to iterate through each of the pieces and each of the outfits within those pieces, uh, which is going to be very useful in this UI of uh, laying out um, all of this. So excellent. Okay, so what do we have? We have a debug. UI that is a work in progress and we now have the structure that we need in order for this debug to work sensibly. Anna, I don't know what you are saying. I don't think I'm used to a uh, an animal, be animal being used as a verb in that. I see. All right. And I think that Lotro is a goat, or possibly an acronym meaning greatest of all time. Well, I haven't seen all time yet, but I am a fan of this game, so fingers crossed. Anna asks, are you a developer or just a player? I am a player who really enjoys making plugins uh, for uh, games that I play, in this case, Lord of the Rings Online. So I do not work for SSG. I don't have any any, any insider information about SSG uh, other than you know what everyone has access to. I pick things up on the forums or on chord streams and that kind of thing. And it asks, are you open to ideas? Um, my idea bucket overflows, but uh, if you have thoughts, you're welcome to put them into chat. We're coming up to the end of the stream, but feel free to uh, pop them in there. Sometimes they're really neat ideas that I am i don't have the ability to work on, and sometimes they're really neat ideas that are in line with things that I do. So if it has to do with minstrels especially, or festivals, or uh, in this case, hid, rebuilding Hidbolt, uh, then it's especially on topic. But yeah, toss it in the chat if you want. Um, and if you aren't able to express it in the next couple of minutes, then come back next week and uh, I'll be back then. Okay, so we have what server do you play on? Asks Anna. We are on Treebeard, which is where I spend most of my time. Treebeard is uh, the current only legendary server, and legendary in this context means that the content is released slowly over time instead of all being available. Uh, it's not a classic server in the style of World of Warcraft, but it is a, uh, a, a slower, more measured feeling to play. So right now on this server, we have the Riders of Rohan expansion, which gives us access to Eastern Rohan, but we don't have Western Rohan yet. So the current server cap is 85, uh, and it'll be another four, uh, maybe three months at this point and it, before we get the uh, Helm's Deep expansion. That being said, it's not a pure um, linear time thing because we do have access to things like Before the Shadow, the Angle of Mithithal, uh, Yondershire, uh, Will, uh, Wildwood, things that have come out more recently than the Riders of Rohan expansion. Um, so it's more of a the level of the content. And so if it's higher level than the uh, Riders of Rohan content, then it's not available is the kind of general rule. All right. So we're going to go ahead and 
look at what changes we just did before we forget. Um, added look up tables for outfits and pieces. I don't think that's the final form of what these should take, but it was a convenient way to solve a problem. Uh, okay. Oh, neighbors, why are you noisy? Uh, that's okay. What's going on with main here? Import options. Oh, okay. We haven't actually finished the options, so moving that around wasn't really a, a, a change. We have the options. Uh, quest window. Okay. That's all in work stuff. I'm happy to leave it. The options window. We haven't really committed this yet, and so that's all in work stuff. All right, great. Uh, it's it's not a clean working directory, but it's only dirtied with stuff that we're actively working on. So that's that's good. Awesome. Um, very cool. Well, we are at ten minutes over two hours of streaming. Excellent. Uh, I think that is plenty for today. So. Um, I believe Mailong is streaming at 9 p.m. server time. I'm not actually sure what it is right now. Server time. It is currently um, almost four. So in about five hours, uh, I believe Mailong is streaming uh, their adventuring back to Rohan stream. Uh, and otherwise, that is everything we are going to cover today. Thank you so much for joining me on this exploration of Lotro plugins. I do hope to see you all here next week, and until then, keep plugging along. All right, bye-bye now.